you're going to be okay? I'm, I'm 63 years old. I'm likely to skate my way to the grave. But I have three young children who are all engineers, and I worry about their ability to work in American manufacturing down the road. I think that the water's gonna get hotter and hotter, and if there's no event to wake people up, I think China can just own more and more and more and more of our debt, and everything's fine until that magical moment when it's not, and all the sorries in the world aren't gonna make that any different. The film you're about to see addresses one of the most urgent problems facing America. It's increasingly destructive trade relationship with a rapidly rising China. As you watch this film, it is important to always distinguish clearly between the good and hardworking people of China and their repressive communist government, now victimizing both American and Chinese citizens alike. I'm here to buy me a big screen TV. My first big screen, man. <laughs> 40 inch. About 265. <laughs> Where's that product made? Probably in China. 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 This is made in China. Do you know where that bike was made? No, but I know it's happy. <laughs> where were these products made, do you know? Uh, probably from China, where we else, everything else made. Oh, it's made in America. Well, American is better. So is this American? I'm not sure if it is American, but hopefully it is. Yeah, I think I got a great deal. Can't be 300 bucks for a 46 inch TV. Tell you the truth, I didn't even come here exactly for this, but I seen it and couldn't pass up the deal, man. For, you know, $200, you can't really, you know, beat that. So they told me it was 200, and now that's in my, it's in my car now, you know? Did you see where it was made? Oh yeah, it was made in China. Hey, I'm fine with it, you know? If the American people can't provide me with what I need, I gotta get it from China. Hey, it is what it is, you know? I'm just being truthful, you know? Don't hate me. So how do you feel when Americans buy Chinese products? I feel really bad because you know what happened is not just an America buying a Chinese product, which is American people losing the jobs. I was laid off uh, three times within six months until I was permanently laid off. I graduated with my bachelor's in 2004. Um, I've been out trying to use that, of course, because I spent a lot of money going to school and I haven't been able to find anything. China, I think, is responsible for, you know, wiping out a good deal of the manufacturing that we have or had in, in Northeast Ohio. 
uh, and I think that is continuing as they continue to manipulate their currency, as they continue to not have the level of workplace safety or environmental or health uh, standards that we have here in the United States. So we've seen our whole manufacturing base uh, uproot and replant in a place where uh, you, you can commit crimes against workers and, and just go out to dinner that night. So when a large company decides to move its production offshore and it closes a factory in a city or town in the United States, that basically, leaves, it's, it's like a black hole. Suddenly that factory just disappears and everything else goes down with it. Jobs disappear um, and the way the economy is going right now, it's, it's tough to find a job. I just, I just recently finished graduate school and um, you know, even coming out with that, it's, it's still hard to find one. Some of the workers at, at companies Literally, their last act at the factory was to unbolt the machine and load it up to be shipped off to China. And I even talked to a fellow down there. They wanted to send him over to China to, to teach the people how to run the machines that they were shipping over there. Uh, he was 63 years old. He said, I only got two more years to go and I can retire, so I'm not going to bother doing it. He said, bad enough they took my job. Now they want me to show them how to do it, too. People who were supplying that plant with materials, equipment, maintenance services, even the accounting firms, design firms, R&D firms, and then all the other services around it, like restaurants, what happens to them? They're doomed. They go down with it. They can't follow that company offshore to Shanghai. It's difficult to be unemployed because you have mortgage and you have your regular bills you have to pay. You have to pay for a car and you have to put food on the table. And when you have just a small amount of money from the state coming in, Sometimes it's hard to make it. I'm trying to get food. <laughs> like, that's what I'm here for. I mean, this is not just unemployment line. This is for people who are hungry, and I'm hungry. And it just really is unfair that, you know, being in a country as great as the United States, to have our people struggling the way they are, to not find what is just common. You work. That's what you do. And for them not to find that month after month after month, it just doesn't make sense to me yet. I don't know if it's the president. I don't know if it's the... Honestly, I, I don't know who to point the blame to. If we talk about who's to blame, I think partially our own government. Our government should be doing something. They could have stepped in, I think, a long time ago. Please hear us and, and please understand that companies like this are special. Small companies are what makes America. And unless somebody does something about unrestricted importing, you're going to lose the rest of us, too. never had a really big and hostile country come into our markets. And most of the international competition that we have faced from Japan, from Germany, from the rest of Europe has come without a sense that behind it was a government that has sought confrontations with the United States on a regular basis. The WTO, it's not based here. I mean, who in the United States is on the WTO. Does anybody know? In 2001, China joined the WTO, the World Trade Organization, with the strong support of a Democratic president and a Republican-controlled Congress. Before the ink was dry on this free trade agreement, China began flooding American markets with its illegally subsidized and very dangerous exports, while the big multinational companies that had lobbied heavily for the agreement rapidly accelerated the offshoring of American factories and American jobs to China. Today, as a result of the biggest political shell game in American economic history, China has stolen thousands of our factories and millions of our jobs. Multinational corporation profits are soaring, and we now owe over $3 trillion to the world's largest communist nation. This was not how it was supposed to turn out. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. When William Jefferson Clinton was selling China's entry into the World Trade Organization to the American people. 
If you believe in a future of greater openness and freedom for the people of China, you ought to be for this agreement. If you believe in a future of greater prosperity for the American people, you certainly should be for this agreement. If you believe in a future of peace and security for Asia and the world, you should be for this agreement. This is the right thing to do. It's an historic opportunity and a profound American responsibility. In pushing for China's entry into the WTO, President Clinton embraced a doctrine dating back to President Richard Nixon, known in Washington circles as the policy of engagement. Peking, historic site for an unprecedented meeting between East and West. President and Mrs. Nixon arrive, and Premier Zhou Enlai is on hand to extend an official welcome to the presidential couple. It's Mr. Nixon's initial move toward his self-proclaimed goal, a generation of peace. Here, President Clinton offers his own vision of the goal of engaging China. I, I don't believe it's right to crack down on people for their religious views or their political expression or because they want to be in an association like the Falun Gong. I don't think that's right. But I don't believe that we will have more influence on China by giving them the back of our hand. In masterfully arguing for China's entry into the World Trade Organization, President Clinton promised the brightest of futures for both American workers and American manufacturers. Economically, this agreement is the equivalent of a one-way street. It requires China to open its markets with a fifth of the world's population, potentially the biggest markets in the world. For the first time, China will agree to play by the same open trading rules we do never happened before. For the first time, our companies will be able to sell and distribute products in China made by workers here in America. And by economically engaging China, both Democrats and Republicans argued this would ultimately democratize the Chinese dragon and free the Chinese people. We have waged an intense battle in support of an important principle, and that is freedom. And the people of China and the citizens of the United States will benefit enormously. After the victory vote, the Republican House majority leaders would celebrate the bipartisan victory with the cracking open of a ceremonial fortune cookie. Not very good at these things. Oh. <laughs> it's got a lottery number, no. <laughs> says, new American proverb. New prosperity awaits you because normal trade relations. Yeah. It's a confrontation of worldviews that we will win, and I'm looking forward to the future. So just what has America's future looked like since China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001? We are in a trade war, and stealing, lying, and cheating on the part of the Chinese is all part of it. Free trade's great stuff if you can get it. What we have with China is not free trade. For China to sell something at one-tenth of the price of what it would cost in the United States to produce, they are cheating monumentally in a major, massive sort of way on everything. When China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, it promised to stop cheating and play by fair trade rules. That meant abandoning unfair trade practices like currency manipulation, illegal export subsidies, and abusing its workers. Instead, the Chinese government has used these weapons of job destruction to launch a sustained and devastating attack on America's factories and jobs, while flooding our markets with dangerous products. There's no question that a large part of China's competitive advantage has come from environmental neglect. But the Chinese government's willingness to use pollution as a competitive edge has come at a heavy price. China has the most degraded environment in the world. 16 of the world's 20th, dirtiest cities are located in the People's Republic. Less than 1% of their urban air meets the air quality standards set by the European Union. It's difficult to think 
about what it's happening, particularly the lungs of children breathing air like that. In one fell swoop, you can move your production to China and not have to deal with 100 years of regulations that we've put into place to protect our workers, to protect our society, just by moving your production to China, because they don't have any. They have what we had probably in 1910. The most tragic story is the cancer villages because of toxic metals in the soil, because of the pollution, because the manufacturers have not been forced to clean up their plants. And so essentially what we have is the world's most degraded environment. Whether you're talking about heavy metals pollution, air pollution, water pollution, China's got it all. And particularly for heavy industries like chemicals or steel, the ability to wantonly pollute in China adds up to a huge cost advantage in the global marketplace. If a company like Bao Steel in China is allowed to dump pollution into the Yangtze River when, say, United States Steel Company is not allowed to do the same in the Ohio River, that's going to be a source of competitive advantage for the Chinese because pollution control costs money. It provides them an economic advantage in environmental cost of approximately $40 a steel ton, or represents about 5% of the cost of producing that steel. Is a 5% cost advantage significant? In the steel industry, 5% cost advantage is greater than our profitability. And here's the ultimate irony. The more we allow our American multinationals to offshore production to China, the more total global pollution we create. And a good bit of that comes right back to America by way of the jet stream. Carbon emissions in China per thousand dollars of GNP are seven times what they are in the United States. That leads to carbon emissions and particulate matter falling all along the coast of the United States. 25% of the particulate emissions falling in California are from Asia in general and China in particular. There are good and bad reasons why goods are cheap in the international economy. The good reason is that somebody's a good producer, that they're quick, that they get the, the product to market, they have good technology, that their workers are efficient and well-trained. The bad reason is that the workers are treated like dirt. When the workers in China are being abused, then workers in America have a tougher time competing against them. As an employer in China, do you have any regulations that you have to deal with, like OSHA, labor regulations? Do you have to pay even Social Security or Medicare? Do you have to protect your workers in difficult or unsafe conditions? No, 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 you don't. You go to prison if you try to form a labor union. Freedom of association, the right to organize and bargain collectively are completely absent in China today. There's no equivalent to OSHA, occupational uh, safety regulations and they lose about 130,000 men and women to, and that's the ones they report on, to accidents per year uh, that many of which could be prevented with good protection. They don't comply with their own child labor laws, prison labor laws, health and safety laws, minimum wage laws. Well, there's a Dr. Lee who lives in New Jersey who uh, was actually an American citizen and he was in China and he was arrested and kept in one of their work camps for uh, three years. When he was finally released, thanks to pressure from the American people, as he came back to New Jersey and he was in a store and he saw these big slippers he'd made in the work camp. Every day, 12, 14, 16 hour a day, you have a labor, you have a quota, okay? If you cannot complete, finish the quota, you will get a punishment. You will go to solitary confinement. And the police always say, good labor, good food. Less labor, less food. You don't labor, no food. How can Walmarts or anyone else in the United States allow uh, production facilities in China to sell garments, chopsticks, Christmas decorations that are made in forced labor camps? You can go to China, go to every prison camp, you can see what are the prisoners doing. Everybody very busy. What are they doing? Put a button on a shirt. What are they doing? You're making the rubber boots. What are they doing? Crowded together, assemble the Christmas lights. It's not all about China currency manipulation, but a lot of it is.
China manipulates its currency by illegally pegging the value of the Chinese yuan to that of the U.S. dollar at a rate far below market value. Most economists would say that, that China gets from a, anywhere from a 25 to 40 cent advantage for every dollar. So it's like having a tariff on goods coming from the United States of 40 or 50 percent by the amount that they're underpricing the currency. It also gives their exports to the United States a subsidy of 40 or 50 percent to capture our market and, de and knock out domestic industries that might be com competing with them. Simply, an undervalued currency makes Chinese coffee makers $10 a piece instead of 15 or 20, and it makes uh, American cars in China $30,000 instead of 25. In other words, China's manipulated currency acts as a huge subsidy to Chinese exports to America and an equally big tariff barrier blocking American exports to China. The result, more jobs in China, fewer jobs in America, and a huge and chronic American trade deficit with China. The Chinese government does not deny this. Chinese officials themselves say that they fix the value of their currencies to help Chinese workers. When Premier Wen Jiabao was in this country recently, he said, if we allow the currency to float, Chinese companies are going to go bankrupt. OK, but what about American workers? They're cheating on the intellectual property by just flat out pirating stuff from the United States. You don't want China to get their hands on your latest piece of technology or whatever because they will copy it and they will turn around and, and produce it. Most famously, copyright pirates in China are stamping out Disney DVDs. That's what everybody knows of. What's more important is the theft of the blueprints, for example, for high technologies. I mean, I hear all the time about American companies who find themselves competing in the marketplace with a Chinese product and they take it apart and they find themselves looking in the mirror because the Chinese have just stolen the plans of their own product. And one of America's highest tech companies has certainly experienced this kind of piracy firsthand and a school of very hard knocks at the hands of the Chinese government. Google came into the Chinese market and of course it ended up with a dominant market share. But Beijing wanted Baidu, a local company, to be able to outpace Google. What Beijing did was it hacked Google's network, it stole its source code, and now Baidu has more than 75% of the China search market. This shows that basically Beijing wants the local companies to be the national champions. But sometimes Chinese pirates aren't content just to steal the intellectual property of an American corporation. Sometimes they just take the whole company. So Fellows is a company that makes shredders, paper shredders, and they moved, like everybody, they moved their production to China. They uh, hired a company to run their production for them, and suddenly one day their employees were locked out of their own plant. So Fellows went from having a large production base in China one day to the next day their partner suddenly shut them off, shut them down. The moral of the Fellows story is you better be very careful when you move your production to a communist country. It makes no sense that China, who produces 45% of the steel in the world, has high manufacturing costs, yet sells steel at the lowest cost in the world and is growing at a rate of 7 or 8%. This growth from 100 million tons to 700 million tons growing by 50 million tons per year is all due to state subsidy. The problem is that uh, American companies cannot compete because they're not competing with Chinese companies. They're, chi they're competing with the Chinese government. At the end of the day, it most certainly will result in more unemployment in the U.S. and to the advantage of China. We're chumps. So just how big of a chump has America been for supporting China's entry into the World Trade Organization in 2001? It's like we're in the Super Bowl of globalization, and in fact, we're being taken apart. And in this Super Bowl of globalization, when you tally up the score on human rights abuses and consider the plight of Tibet, the torture of the Falun Gong, 
and the crushing of religion and democracy. This much is clear. The Chinese government is the world's worst human rights abuser on the planet today. And when you tally up the score on China's rapid military buildup, this too is clear. China is the only major nation in the world that is preparing to kill Americans. And of course, when you count the jobs lost and factories gone and millions of Americans out of work. American manufacturing has been in an absolute crisis over the last decade. Five and a half million manufacturing jobs gone. 57,000 manufacturing facilities closed in this nation. So you're in a massive jobless recovery. You've got 28 million women and men who are in various stages of unemployment, twice the official number. When you tally up all these scores, it's crystal clear that China's entry into the World Trade Organization has been both a losing and a very dangerous proposition. Even as America has all but completely surrendered its manufacturing base to China. We don't make a single cell phone in the United States. Not one is made in the United States. There is not a single modern flat panel display factory in the United States. Does that matter? Are flat panel displays uh, important for military applications? I think so. They're widely used. Every airplane, every helicopter has them. The United States right now is unable to put a single military aircraft into the sky without using components built by potential adversaries. We produce about $3 billion worth of printed circuit boards in the United States. China produces almost $20 billion. Machine tools, where we, we produce $2.7 billion. China's consumption was 10 times that amount. If you don't have a machine tool industry, what, you know, do you have an industry? It's a you know, basic component of an industrial economy. But what about those green industries that some of our politicians say will create the jobs of the future? That's one of the reasons why we're accelerating the transition to a clean energy economy and doubling our use of renewable energy sources like wind and solar power. Steps that have the potential to create whole new industries and hundreds of thousands of new jobs in America. But here's the grim reality. We produce 4% of the world's global output of solar. One of the things happening in the market right now is it's being swamped by low-cost multicrystalline and polycrystalline uh, silicon solar cells from China. We don't make computers. We don't make printers. We import 99% of our shoes. Mass-produced consumer products, we basically don't make them anymore. But it's not just mass-produced consumer goods we are losing to China. Some of our very best paying manufacturing jobs are also now quite literally being shanghai Boeing at its peak in the Seattle Everett area had about 50,000 employees. That was no more than five years ago. 20,000 of those jobs have now moved to China in just the last five years. Apple employs 26,000 people in its design of making new products. It employs, through Foxconn, 700,000 manufacturing workers in China. They're an American company, they're headquartered here. All their jobs are somewhere else. Americans need those jobs, but they all exist in China. Every one of those manufacturing jobs exists in China. These are jobs that could very easily be in Silicon Valley, in Oregon, uh, Northern California, in general, along the coast, uh, for which they're well-trained and, and very interested in women and men who would take them in a heartbeat. And even white-collar workers are now in China's crosshairs. The white-collar worker understands that China is now moving up in the uh, feeding uh, frenzy to, for example, software and other kinds of production. They're moving away from just process technology up to more really intellectual technology. Now, it's not a very big part of their economy, but you can look in the United States, it's having a devastating effect. If the jobs for production move to China, the support jobs for white collar to a big degree will move to China. Meanwhile, our rapidly accumulating Chinese debt has become a national joke, literally. That's right, China's mad at President Obama for meeting with the Dalai Lama. I mean, come on. Obama doesn't owe them anything, except like $14 trillion. <laughs> and that debt represents a very real claim on American assets. And then China would back a tow truck up to Kansas and drag it off to Guangdong province. I find it ironic that the corner of capitalism, the J.P. Morgan building down on Wall Street, is now owned by a Chinese company. 
As for that hope that economic engagement would lead to a more free and democratic China. George Bush Sr., remember him? He was the ambassador to China back way back when. And so he liked China. He liked those guys over there. Things are good in China. Economic growth in China has not led to its becoming more democratic. It has led to a more sophisticated, better financed form of authoritarianism. And ironically, one of those measures of repression has been the internet itself, which was supposed to set China free. China is less free today than it was when it entered the WTO. China has 50,000 internet police who are tracking every day their capabilities, who's saying what, to be able to try and keep things like Tiananmen Square, democracy, freedom, and those terms off the internet. And these cyber cops have had plenty of help from American companies in building the great firewall of China. Google, Yahoo, Cisco, and the capability that they have sold to China, especially for its secret police, has enabled them to, to search, apprehend, discover the whereabouts, get caches of, of names, particularly online, where if you send your emails to other people, their IP addresses quickly yield to what their physical addresses are, and they're then apprehended and arrested. This American cooperation, damn it, shame. Cooperate with Chinese government. They have to say, we have to follow Chinese law. Cisco say, we have to follow Chinese law. Yahoo say, we have to follow Chinese law, otherwise we cannot do it. Yeah, you have to follow Soviet law. You have to follow Hitler law. Are you going to do it? Perhaps the most shameful answer to that question may be found in Yahoo's role in the jailing of a Chinese citizen named Shi Tao. Here's a guy, a journalist, who sent information to an NGO about what they couldn't say or do as the Tiananmen Square Remembrance Day was coming up, or days, and he sent it to the New York NGO. Chinese government knocked on the door of the, um, the Yahoo people, asked for the information, they just coughed it right up, and Shi Tao got 10 years for that. As for those Falun Gong practitioners and other dissidents singled out by President Clinton. I had a hearing on the Falun Gong and how they're throwing these people in jail by the thousands and they're harvesting organs. The way it works is that if somebody goes to, wants a, a liver, say, they fly to Shanghai and they probably go check into the number one people's hospital in Shanghai. A military surgeon, probably in uniform, one I'm thinking of, comes up and does the Bishu tests and the, and the blood tests and so on. Then he, he or she looks on the computer list and says, oh, there's a match out in work camp 400. The poor victim who matches what, you, what your organs need is dragged into a sort of hospital, given a light anesthetic in most cases, and uh, never wakes up because they take not just one kidney, they take both kidneys, the liver, heart, everything, and their body is then burned. And the People's Liberation Army flies the organ to Shanghai from wherever the camp happens to be, and you're told you're getting the organ from a convicted murderer or something. I mean, this is a grotesque tale of, of the worst kind of oppression and ghoulishness on the part of rulers of a country. And here is what too many American politicians seem to have such a hard time understanding. Wei Jing Chang told me in Beijing, right before he got rearrested, you Americans don't understand. When you coddle dictatorship, when you, when you kowtow and you carry the dictatorship around on a pillow, they beat us more in the Lao Gai. When you're tough, predictable, transparent on human rights, they beat us less. But at least engaging China economically has made the ruling Communist Party more peaceful, right? China's military power is strengthening very, very rapidly. They are building up their military capabilities in hard weapons as well as in cybersecurity. China has a population which is about five times the size of the United States. And that means that uh, if they have a comparable level of development, they probably will end up with a military five times larger. Now, I don't care what kind of technological edge we have, it would be very difficult to prevail over an adversary that is five times larger. What China is building is just not a massive fleet or a massive ground army, but it's developing a modern, well-equipped, technologically capable military. 
And in some cases, it need not be China pulling the trigger. <laughs> or launching the missiles, as the case may be. We are on the onset of an age of nuclear terrorism. We see Pakistan crumbling while it builds more and more nuclear weapons. Why does Pakistan have nuclear weapons? Why does it have the missiles to deliver them? Because of China. We've been in a near 30-year dialogue with the Chinese government trying to arrest this behavior that is uh, supporting not only Pakistan's, but North Korea's and Iran's future nuclear capabilities. China refuses to listen and respond when a nuclear bomb goes off on some highway, uh, either inside or outside the beltway, chances are a lot of those components on that bomb are going to say made in China. children Thomas the train sets recall because the, the ink the, on the red ones was lead poison. They not only ruined our economy, they poisoned our children with the toys that we give them. I want to be careful about what products I buy because I want to know that they're safe and they're good. I want to be careful about what products I buy because I want to make sure that the people who are producing those are being treated properly. And I want to be careful about the products I buy because I want to make sure that the people in my community are people who are able to have jobs at a decent wage. And all of those things are tied together. Every time a consumer walks into a Walmart, first thing they have to do is be aware enough to look for the label. Then when they pick up that good and it says made in China, I want them to think, hmm, it might either break down or it could kill me. Number one, this thing, if I buy it, might cost me or someone in my family or my friends their job. Lastly, hey, if I buy this, that money's going to go over to help finance what is essentially the most rapid military buildup of a totalitarian regime since when? The 30s. I mean, make no mistake about that. 91% of every product in a Walmart store is manufactured in China. Walmart spent $50 billion in China two years ago. If Walmart were a country, they would be China's fourth largest trading partner. When an American goes into a Walmart and buys a product made in China, that person is thinking just price. If you're a person on a pension shopping at Walmart, you kind of like the Great Wall of Mart. But what they really need to think about is how that product got there. It got there because you have a predatory system which is really trying to undercut American manufacturers and therefore American workers. And when a consumer goes into Walmart, picks up a good made in China, what do you want them to think about before they get to the cash register? Think about your relative that just got laid off or the factory that just got shut down. Think about the uh, school that is doing with less because the manufacturing base has gone and the tax base has left. Think about the lower income that you're receiving now because we're not making products and we're not buying our own products. When Americans buy a product from Walmart, I want them to remember the children, the family, the workers who has earned very, very little from those products. This is not just an economic matter, this is a security matter, because the Chinese government has made it clear that it wants to undermine America's role in the world. So, yeah, things are cheap at Walmart, but we have to understand the consequences. But even if you don't want to consider the broader economic or national security consequences of consuming goods made in China, you may at least want to think about your own personal safety and that of your family. If you put it in your mouth or the hands of a child, don't buy it from China. Over the last five years, we've had a number of scandals involving Chinese products. And these products have killed people, not only in China, but also in the United States. Do you want to buy pipe for your residential community that's going to 
put all the water into everybody's houses that is tainted with arsenic and mercury so that it'll leach out into your water so that when you turn on your spigot in your house, you're suddenly, uh, you know, contaminating yourself because that pipe was made cheaper in China. Goodyear Tire in, outside of Montreal that closed about four years ago and put 850 people out of work. Moved the production to China because they could make tires, I think it was for $4 a tire cheaper. And uh, not long after they they started up in China, they, the transportation agency in the U.S. said the tires being produced there were unsafe. I mean, is this what corporate America or corporate Canada is, thinks is the way they should be conducting themselves? I don't think so. We're importing a lot of their apples. They, they spray them with Alar. <laughs> you know, that's illegal in the United States. You want DDT on your apple? Buy it from China. And we're buying a lot of apples from China. We're buying everything from China. And there are no environmental controls. There is a risk of suffocation, that kids can get trapped and die. They took them to the hospital where they pronounced them dead. Massive recall of a million of Mattel's Fisher Price toys. A recent batch made in China contains toxic levels of lead paint. Those teddy bears can loosen and fall out, posing a choking According hazard. According to the state media, dozens of babies had developed kidney stones in recent days. Thousands of pets across the country died after eating tainted pet food. That led to a, a massive pet food recall. My wife finally died in December after receiving heparin that was later recalled by Bastard. My son Randy died a month later under the same circumstances. Some brands have been found to contain a toxic chemical used in antifreeze. Pork from pigs, force-fed wastewater. If it comes from China and the price seems too good to be true, then it probably is. It is very difficult for any country to protect their citizens from Chinese products. The real problem here is that you have a political system that does not punish manufacturers for bad products. And it's because it's the nature of the political system. The Communist Party does not allow independent prosecutors, doesn't allow a free press, doesn't allow people to complain about bad products. Let's take fish. There are 3.5 million fish farms in China. The fish are raised in contaminated ponds. They're fed all kinds of hormones. And the biggest market for that fish is the United States. 85% of the tilapia comes from China. Most of our shrimp comes from China. US FDA only has the ability to inspect 1% of the fish coming into the United States. 65% of the 1% they reject. They don't have the authority to confiscate the fish. So if the ship comes into Charleston and gets rejected, then it goes to Miami or New Orleans or some other port, and eventually the fish gets in. And because of such dangers, Americans are becoming more and more aware of the Made in China label. But that doesn't always guarantee one's safety or convenience. I personally do look at the labels of where things are made. But sometimes I go to buy things and it's impossible to find something that isn't made in China. But my wife's a good card-carrying liberal. She believes in all the worthy causes in the world and all that sort of thing. And she's an intelligent woman, I want to say, for the record. Little by little, I realized that China was getting to where it was and the United States was getting to where it was because there was all this currency manipulation. And it just seemed like the United States government was not doing a whole lot in the name of international trade to try to stop what was going on in China, which was able to lure a lot of jobs. Some months ago, she decided that, to the best of her ability, she wasn't going to buy anything made in China. So our microwave oven failed. We don't have a new microwave oven because she could not find one that was not made in China. When I went to look for a microwave, a freestanding microwave, there was nothing that wasn't made in China. I went to five different stores, from high-end hardware stores to low-end discount places. Nothing was available that wasn't made in China. And my experience from things made in China was that they weren't healthy. You never knew what was in them. They didn't work for very long. And they broke down if they worked in the beginning. So I then decided I just wasn't going to buy anything that was made in China. So we just, you know, do not have a microwave anymore. Right around the same time, we had a uh, under a counter electric unit for heating in one of the rooms. And the same thing happened. 
you couldn't get any electric baseboard that wasn't made in China. And I thought, well, my last one was made in America. I had it for 23 years. It worked great. Now I couldn't find it. And I just got completely discouraged that no American manufacturers were coming in to produce quality products over here. And that's the dilemma we now find ourselves in. As China has used its weapons of job destruction to so thoroughly capture our markets, we are left with few choices other than to buy from China. But the more we buy from China, the more risks our families face from dangerous Chinese products. And the more jobs we lose. And because this is true, we now must also confront this much bigger truth. We import a lot of stuff from China, but a lot of it we don't pay for. I mean, we've got no goods to ship in the opposite direction. So we just ship bundles of dollar bills. Between two and three trillion dollars is available to buy up pieces of America. In other words, we're living beyond our means. We have a, an artificially high standard of living. We're consuming more than we create. That's a very dangerous situation, okay? And especially if your principal creditor is a nation like China. So just exactly how did we in America allow ourselves to be backed into such a dangerous Chinese corner? When you live in a democracy, it's always subjected to being hijacked. And our democracy has been hijacked by the multinational corporations. The corporate responsibility is to its shareholders, and it often has a legal fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders. The government has responsibility to the people and the national interest. Those are not necessarily the same. U.S. multinational corporations knew exactly what was going to happen. They didn't have any plans to increase exports to China after China joined the WTO. They had plans to move production to China, but they were, I'd say, dishonest or disingenuous because the whole rhetoric around China joining the WTO was about free trade and opening markets and engaging with China. For the first time, our companies will be able to sell and distribute products in China made by workers here in America. When in fact, it was really self-interest and profit motive on the part of U.S. multinationals that drove that debate. And U.S.-China commissioner and businessman Dan Slane knows firsthand just how this offshoring shell game is working since China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001 and began flooding American markets with illegally subsidized exports. I had a plywood manufacturing facility in Bowling Green, Kentucky, selling plywood to furniture manufacturers in the United States. In 2002, all my competitors were moving to China. Uh, essentially, I had two choices. I shut the company down or I moved it to China. And I opened up three factories in China and delivered to the customer in the United States 50% cheaper than I could make it in Bowling Green. And Slane's newfound competitive edge was all due to China's illegal weapons of job destruction. Manipulating the currency was a huge help for me because it kept our prices down. I had no environmental issues. And the most important thing was that I could sell my product at cost. And every month, the Chinese government would send me a check for 17% of my exports. And that was my net margin and my profit. So was Slain wrong to offshore his factories to China? This interchange with U.S.-China commissioner and multinational corporation lobbyist William Reinch offers some perspective. It's not generally regarded as the job of a large American company to, uh, you know, substitute itself for the government. Uh, what but most of the companies want to do is to, they want to be consistent with government, the, with U.S. law and U.S practice if the government tells them that they would like them to do something uh, they generally do it so they don't have any responsible per se to the American people other than obeying the existing laws and regulations is that fair well what responsibility would you like them to have to the American people other than trying to be good corporate citizens and to be profitable would you define a good corporate citizen as a company that moves its factories over to China and creates massive unemployment in the Midwest. Is that good corporate citizen? Well, I think that you'd have to ask, you'd have to look at, uh, you'd have to go case by case. 
and in Dan Slane's case? The difference between myself and General Electric is that I had no choice. I either moved to China or I shut the company down. I couldn't compete. Jeff Immel at General Electric does have a choice. He can sacrifice some profits, keep his technology, and in the long term, be much better off manufacturing in the United States. Congressman Tim Ryan understands this distinction between small domestic manufacturers and the big, well-heeled multinationals better than most. There's a huge divide here between the mom-and-pop a tool and die maker that has been in Youngstown, Ohio for a hundred years in the global corporation that's involved in the global financing of all of this stuff, the global manufacturing, and not really concerned with any one country. They're concerned with how they can best do business. And one of the biggest obstacles to passing tough legislation that would stop China's unfair trade practices is the lack of political clout of America's domestic manufacturers. And to go chasing down after all of the political rhetoric of dealing with this issue and that issue and running for Albany or running to Washington DC and setting up meetings and stuff, um, it's too costly, it's too time consuming and it has nothing to do with building drum and barrel handling equipment and helping this company to be successful. And that's the issue here. They don't have lobbyists down here. There's very few uh, organizations that really represent um, the small and mid-sized manufacturers. Uh, you know, I can think of one or two that really do a great job, but they don't have the the impact, the campaign contributions, the corporate influence that some of the big dogs have. And just who is one of the biggest dogs on the Capitol Hill lobbying block? Behind me is the headquarters of the National Association of Manufacturers, which unfortunately has become a major misnomer in recent years, because the name really should be the National Association of Manufacturing Things Someplace Else. If you go back and you look at the uh, National Association of Manufacturers meetings in which they were talking about endorsing or not endorsing uh, the Ryan Murphy China currency bill, uh, you will see that there was a huge split where the small and medium-sized manufacturers endorsed the bill. But the 20% of the membership that gives 80% of the dues didn't want to have anything to do with the Ryan Murphy China currency bill. Brian O'Shaughnessy is the chairman of Revere Copper, a company founded by none other than Paul Revere and the oldest manufacturer in America. And O'Shaughnessy has been on the inside of the National Association of Manufacturers when it has opposed bills like those offered up by Tim Ryan to stop China's currency manipulation. I stood up before a group of 300 of the most powerful CEOs in this country, and I told them, as we consider NAM support of this bill, I think those of you who have facilities in China I think you should recuse yourself from voting. You're conflicted. You have to choose between your company and your country. And you can't do that. Well, I was shot down in flames. By all intents and purposes, a lot of these companies are not American companies anymore. General Motors takes TARP money and opens up factories in China. Caterpillar Tractor shuts down plants in Peoria and opens up three factories in China. General Electric and Boeing are essentially trying to become Chinese companies. Look at Coca-Cola. American sounding company, isn't it? I mean, how American can you get other than Revere, Coca-Cola? The president of Coca-Cola is from South Africa. The chairman is from Turkey. Now, you want to ask them what America's international trade policy should be? You shouldn't listen to them. While Coca-Cola's executive suite may look like the United Nations, it is purebred American CEOs from companies like Cisco, Ford, IBM, Honeywell, Motorola, Intel, and Apple that keep sending so many of our jobs to China. We design the iPad, great. We get the profits from the iPad, fine. We don't get the jobs. Profits versus jobs. That's a conflict Ralph Gomery sees as the root of America's offshoring problem. They are pursuing maximizing profit. 
That's their goal. The country is losing the wage bill, and its goal is to have wages. And then what they're doing is right for their shareholders and their constituents, but it's not right for the people of America who are unable to find work today. The problem with our system is that it's everything is short term. So when you talk to a CEO and you say to a CEO, an American CEO, do you realize that they're going to take your technology and they're going to be your competitor? The CEO says, yes, but I only have three or four years to get my stock up so I can get my bonus. And they kick the can down the road and it's the next guy's problem. This will end badly for all of us, but everybody is so short term in thinking and in their tenure that they're willing to take chances that are right for today that they probably know in their minds is long-term bad for America tomorrow. Ironically, nobody understood this growing divergence between corporate interests and the common good better than candidate Bill Clinton during the 1992 elections. You must do your part. You must be responsible. American companies must act like American companies again, exporting products, not jobs. But such corporate irresponsibility wasn't always the American way. Corporations used to think they had a stakeholder theory. In other words, they had a responsibility to the nation, to their community, to their workers, and to their shareholders. Something morphed in our own system about 20, 25 years ago, where shareholder value became the end all and be all. And then the CEOs tied their own compensation to shareholder value. And then other countries figured out how to incentivize them to increase short-term shareholder value by transferring production, manufacturing, R&D there. And we can never forget that when China manipulates currency, when China provides illegal subsidies of all sorts for, for manufacturing, for the act of exporting itself, these U.S.-owned companies benefit. They like the status quo. They want to protect it, and they have paid a lot of money for it. Money and the power of America's multinational corporations in influencing China trade policy. That's something two men from two distinctly different worlds can agree on. And I live in that world. I watch those dollars go. Campaign laws allow them to spend unlimitless amounts of money. It's a tsunami. But to former White House advisor Jared Bernstein, it's more than just money in politics driving our jobs offshore. It's also the prevailing free market view in the Oval Office, regardless of political party. I think there is a deeply embedded view that I do not think is wholly wrong, that capital must be happy if we're going to have a successful economy. And no multinational company has been happier to move its capital offshore than General Electric. But this is truly a fool's game. The Chinese have no intention of turning over their domestic market to foreign companies. Once they're able to master the technology, they are going to make it very difficult for foreign corporations to make a profit. When I go out and do speeches to corporate audiences on China and they want me to talk about strategy, it's like, hey, you're going over to China. You're giving them your avionics so you can participate in a regional jet game in China. And two or three or five years from now, you're going to try to sell your regional jets in Europe, and your biggest competitor is going to be that China guy. How stupid is that? What's happening, unfortunately, in the United States is way too many of our multinational corporations, not only they're shifting their manufacturing overseas, but along with it goes their technology, their intellectual property. And while many of us are concerned, deeply concerned about the loss of jobs, we're just as concerned about the loss of intellectual property. That's sort of the future of America. The thing is, nobody's really looked at all the industries that have been lost. Nobody's really, it's very hard to get information on the industries that are gone or that are just about gone because the government doesn't keep track of any data. They don't follow industries. They have no market analysts who follow specific industries. So nobody knows what's happened with all of our industrial capacity that's vanished or is in the process of vanishing. The next thing you see is you're not doing any work over there yourself. The Chinese are doing it for you entirely. And we see that. The two mid-range aircraft in the world are the Airbus 319 and, and the Boeing 737. Five years from now, the Chinese have already told both companies they will no longer buy either aircraft. That mid-range aircraft, the one that 
is dominant throughout Asia uh, will be entirely manufactured in China under a Chinese mark or name uh, using technology that they took from Airbus on the one hand and Boeing on the other. Look around, well, tell me what you see. Every day, more people in the street. Too bad they sent our jobs away. In China, they're not workers, they're just slaves. People wait. It's a world of trade and greed And the CEOs get richer And our jobs all move offshore oh. The Soviet Union could make an unbelievable intercontinental ballistic missile but they couldn't make a loaf of bread. Now we can make a stealth fighter, but we can't make a pair of shoes. You can't be a world power if you don't make anything but hot air. And we're well on our way to that. You can't have sustainable long run economic growth at robust levels in the absence of a manufacturing base. Less than 9% of American workers are now in the manufacturing sector. We as a country can't survive into the long term with under 25% of our women and men making things. Manufacturing jobs have a higher multiplier than service industry jobs. That is to say, every one manufacturing job that you bring into a community ultimately supports half a dozen other jobs. If you are honest about how jobs have evolved in the United States, small business arose only when there was a stable manufacturing base put under them. My mother uh, and many mothers of yours, I'm sure, up on the commission, uh, they gave themselves home permanence. It was only when there was a stability of middle-class incomes that you had beauty parlors and nail salons and pizza parlors and McDonald's and all of the things we think of as small business. Every one manufacturing job that you bring into a community ultimately supports half a dozen other jobs. Those manufacturers provide the good paying jobs in our community and it's the jobs that a father or mother can work at the factory, raise their family, have some health care, have a safe pension, donate a little bit of money into the basket in church on Sunday, vote for the school levy, vote for the police, police and fire levy to help build strong communities. And when those factories got wiped out and they went from 200 to 30 people, it becomes very difficult for these communities to sustain themselves. Ultimately, the most important reason why America must restore its manufacturing base is to hold on to the research and development, the R&D. That is the taproot of all of the technological innovations we will need to create new jobs in new industries. Manufacturing is the origin of 70% of U.S. R&D. That's true even today. You can't do your R&D here and do your manufacturing there. You can't move your manufacturing overseas and not move your technology and all your engineering. I mean, it's nice to do R&D and come up with a super duper design or a new product, but if you can't make it, what's the sense of doing the R&D? When we say we've kept our technology or our IP, but we've moved our manufacturing, that's just not true. It's an impossible feat. They're totally coupled. So as, as manufacturing has moved offshore, R&D has gone right with it. So as we move more and more manufacturing over to China and people can re-engineer and understand how things are made, we are teaching the country how to compete with us, and ultimately they are. So that uh, the new products, the next cutting edge product, is being developed there where the manufacturing is going on in China rather than here where the manufacturing was and now is no longer.
need to change course. We need definitive U.S. action. We need to show the Chinese that there are limits, that they have to be responsible citizens, and if that they're not responsible citizens, there are consequences. I like the idea of doing business with China. There are a few people over there, but it should be, it must be on our terms. If it's not on our terms, then it's on their terms, and if it's on their terms, they don't have our best interests in mind. People sometimes say that we can't stand up to the Chinese on any of these issues because we risk starting a, quote, trade war. My message to the American people is that we're already in a trade war. What's wrong with taking China to task? They pirate our technology, they pirate our intellectual property rights, they counterfeit right. our goods and services, and no administration has the backbone to stand up to them. It's been dismaying for me to see a succession of administrations, both Republican and Democratic, unable or unwilling to take on the China trade imbalance. And I would say part of that is the very cozy relationship that any White House has with the big multinational corporations and with the intellectual elite that have taken a very soft view on this issue. So I think both Democratic and Republican administrations have failed us in the same way. So how do we, the people, overcome the power and influence of the big multinational companies and the deadly inertia of our political leadership? to bring about long overdue changes in the U.S.-China trade relationship. You know, it almost takes a movement. A Tea Party that's different than, it's completely divorced of left or right. Or it's virtually a Tea Party that differentiates between right and wrong, which is very much different than left or right. I think this can only happen when the American people really understand what is happening to us and begin to demand that their congressmen and senators really, and the national government, take action in these areas. I think that at every level, people could boycott to some extent, and there would be a shot heard around the world. It's got to be a whole community effort by the citizen, but we do need to create jobs. It doesn't always happen accidentally. Here's the message that needs to be developed. You know, look, it doesn't have to be this way. This is an economy and a global economy that has been made by policy choices. Policy choices that really do uh, benefit the, the rich and the multinationals. Their interests no longer coincide with the interests of this country. So we have to do what's best for this country. They'll do what's best for their company, but we have to do what's best for this country. And that means all of us coming together, building an economy, that really does work for everybody. So how do we build such an economy? We have to decide as a nation that we want manufacturing, that we want prosperity and the good jobs and income that come with manufacturing. The only thing that matters to me is Flint, Michigan, Dayton, Ohio, and Buffalo, New York. If you don't reestablish the manufacturing base of, of, of this country, roughly at the level of 20 to 25 percent of workers, and the most immediate way to do that is trade reform with China. The best jobs program is trade reform with China. And the argument is pretty simple. The gross domestic product grows with only four things, consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. And when you run a trade deficit, the simple math of that is that that's a negative in terms of growth. I think the number one thing that the United States has to do is to move to say, we're going to balance our trade Look, if we had had balanced trade, you wouldn't have had a decade of, 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 of a drag on GDP that amounted to almost a point per year. So, of course, we would be better off. Now, people say, how do you do that? And I, I would, I'm a young guy when President Kennedy said, we're going to the moon. He didn't have a clue how to get to the moon. But we set it as a national goal, and we figured out how to do it because we're a smart, creative people. And if we are to truly balance our trade, we cannot do it by boosting exports alone. President Obama says, let's export more. We're now exporting more than $100 billion a year in goods and services to China. But it isn't exports that matter. It's the difference between imports and exports. Exports are great, but if your imports grow more rapidly than your exports, there's a drain on demand for what Americans make. We get more unemployment, and the economy sinks into the kind of mess we're in. If you look at America today, we have a very fast-growing export uh, sector. 
And people talk about how we're gonna come back with exports, that's just all silly. America is going to come back from import substitution. We don't have to take over the world in exports. We simply need to get back our market here. In fact, American consumers and citizens seem to be far ahead of our politicians when it comes to understanding both the dangers we face and the need for fundamental change. We're a subsidiary of China and getting worse and worse because they're going to own us pretty soon. No, you can't have it both ways. We either want the jobs, the manufacturing, everything here in the United States, and we're gonna buy it, but you go to the store, and you look for the cheapest thing, which usually comes from China. I do buy China stuff, but I'd prefer to buy American things. Why? Uh, I think it's better just to support the economy here, rather than, you know, you can buy cheaply in China, but I think it's better for our economy if we buy here. We also gotta look at our principles, too. Look how they're living. Is that what we want to support? We open up our markets to everybody. And uh, I, I think that if that's how it's going to be, it needs to be a two-way street. And I think, I think politically, our system has not supported you know, the, the American worker, the American product from that standpoint. And perhaps the biggest reason our politicians are failing us is because they have truly forgotten the proper role of government. I used to debate a, a colleague of mine, my counterpart from the Chamber of Commerce, and he used to say to me, you know, it's not my job to play Santa Claus to the workers or to paint my company green. It's my job to make money for the shareholders. And I agree with that. That is the job of corporations, but it is government's job to make sure that companies are doing that within a framework that makes sense. I think the, the field uh, that we're playing on not only needs to be leveled, but I think everybody needs to be on one field. We're not even on the same field as the Chinese. We are paying very good wages. We are providing health care to our employees. We are in a regulated business as far as workplace safety for our employees. Uh, we pay our taxes gladly, and we cannot compete with a non-regulated workplace that pays their employees pennies and uh, are allowed to import their goods into this country with no restrictions. I mean, what is the alternative for America? Say every, all of our workers should take a 50%, 60% pay cut, and then we'll, then we'll really take on China. We'll, be, we'll get them or you know, have dirtier air or have the Cuyahoga River catch on fire again because there's so much pollution going in. Is that really how we're going to compete with China? I think it's the complete opposite. I think we reinvest back into our workers. I think we jumpstart the middle class, and I think have policies in place that would encourage manufacturing back here to put those good jobs uh, in place here in the United States. States. But even if we ultimately solve our economic problems, there will still be very difficult challenges ahead in the U.S.-China relationship. If tensions do rise, we must always remember this. There's a real difference between the Chinese people and the Chinese government. Most of the criticisms that we have are of the Chinese government, the actions that the Chinese government has taken with respect to trade policy and worker rights repression, and the Chinese people suffer from a lot of those same policies. China until today is a totalitarian regime, is a dynasty. No change at all, no republic, not people's country. We need to understand China better. We have this sort of glowy view of the trajectory of China's history. But what we have seen, especially over the last couple of years, is a China that is moving in the wrong directions on everything. And it's not just human rights. It's its relations with its neighbors, its economy, you name it. This is a country that is going backwards in all phases. I hear people referring to the PRC or the People's Republic. Well, let's be honest. As soon as we accept that phrase, we're joining China in the reality distortion field. It's a lie. It is not the people's and it is not the republic. Stop saying that. It's communist China. We've got to spread the word that there's danger out there and we need to change our policies. We can no longer afford to treat a communist dictatorship in China uh, as we would treat any other democratic institution because they have treated us like fools for doing that. And that's because we have been fools.
Look around or tell me what you see Every day more people in the street Said I used to work in a factory Right now I'd work for anything Oh, 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 oh. It's not me, but my family I wish to feed. Not much, but we got simple needs. Too bad. Send our jobs away In China They're not workers They're just slaves People wait It's a world of trade and greed And the CEOs get richer And our jobs all move offshore Oh, oh His son got a college degree. He dreamed I run in a factory. Now he's back home, just living with me. And there's no bright future my boy could see. Sixteen hours. Seven days a week Of unions and freedoms they cannot speak Gotta rise and get up off your knees Before they buy up all our dreams store and spend our money, send all our dollars overseas, this ain't the land of milk and honey, this is the land of treat and greed. we go to the store and spend our money, And all our dollars overseas This ain't the land of milk and honey This is the land of treat and that's what good, what's good for multinationals is good for America, that's completely wrong.